Hello everyone. My name is Kate Tringham. I'm the editor of James Navy International and it's my great pleasure today to welcome you to this online intelligence briefing. Today our naval analysts Alex Pape and Michaeli Capoletto together with Mike Faby, the James Americas Naval Reporter, and Ridzwan Ramat, our senior naval reporter for the Asia-Pacific region, will present a session entitled Global Aircraft Carrier Operations. The James Intelligence Briefing Program will consist of approximately 40 events during 2017 and is available to all customers of James Intelligence Center and Module Products, including the market's forecast products. Large aircraft carrier programs today continue to be the subject of debate, particularly when it comes to the question of sustainability and value for money. Nevertheless, naval operators with global foreign policy ambitions still rely on these platforms to achieve robust sea control and long-range power projection. And around the world, there are a number of countries that are looking to either maintain or expand their existing carrier capabilities. Today's webinar puts the spotlight on some of these programs, focusing in particular on technological and operational advances. First up today, we have McKaylee, who will be looking at global carrier programs in general, including historic overview and future projection. Mike will then provide insight on US carrier developments and Ridzwan will outline developments in China. Alex will then provide an overview of carrier fleets and service with other key operator navies, including the UK, India, France and Russia. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my introduction. But just before I hand over to McKaylee, I'd like to highlight that the information used to compile today's presentation has been drawn from a variety of James content, but in particular James Markets Forecast military ships and James Defence Equipment and Technology. Now, over to you, Michaeli. Thank you very much, Kate. So as it was just mentioned, I will start by providing a bit of an introduction in order to set the ground for our discussion today before dealing with specific carrier programs with the other speakers. Aircraft carriers are generally considered the most important and capable power projection asset at sea. What is more controversial, though, is whether these platforms still provide good value for money in today's world. In a context of growing economic interdependence and constantly shrinking defense budgets, people that see value in aircraft carriers argue that the carrier's weapon, namely the organic fixed-wing naval aircraft, offer an incomparable military instrument. The naval aircraft plus warship combination allows a country to project tactical air power at long distances, and most importantly, they can do so without the need to obtain access, basing, or overflight rights from any host country. Carriers can also play an important deterrent role without the need to deploy the aircraft. Sending an aircraft carrier close to an enemy's shore sends quite a powerful message indeed. And besides all of this, uh, being part of the so-called carrier club can also be a good car to play in soft power terms because it maximizes the carrier's impact also in the political diplomatic arena. All of these advantages, however, come at a cost and when we talk about carriers, it is a pretty big one. Carriers are not only very expensive to build and work up but also to operate and support and they normally have life cycles of around 50 years which means a long-term commitment on many levels. A carrier program is demanding for industry as well and it requires a very capable Navy and Naval Air Force when operation time comes. To build on this point, uh, aircraft carriers also have a requirement for accompanying ships during their deployments, all of which adds up on cost and complexity. They need both escorts and a float support, otherwise they can become relatively easy high-value targets for foes. Additional discussions on carriers focus on how to mitigate the threat currently posed by A to AD strategies, or cyber threats and missiles as well, and also uh, on light carrier concepts specifically with reference to the US. More to the point, however, we have seen a number of carrier-related developments making the news in this past year. And so, for, in for instance, we have seen the UK's largest ever aircraft carrier, the first of two units in the Queen Elizabeth class, that has left its dockyard to begin contractors' sea trials in June this year. The US Navy commissioned their first new aircraft carrier class in more than 40 years, when USS Gerald Ford was put into active service in July 2017. 
Earlier this year, too, China, in April, launched its first domestically built aircraft carrier. And our projection here for this chart for 2030 is that all countries uh, looking at large amphibious assault ships or similar uh, and helicopter carriers um, and maybe operating F-35 in one way or other in their existing Air Force inventories may consider the uh, stubble version as well, in which case we would have uh, an interesting picture, and uh, the clear takeaways are initially that the U.S. has a considerable fleet of um, other ships other than the, the nuclear-powered carriers that can deliver air power, the, the amphibious warfare ships, and also that China will have a, have a similar picture that would project a number of amphibious assault ships. Um, of course, China has yet to develop a stubble aircraft that could operate of these. The other key uh, takeaway for, for this view is that a number of countries, including Japan, Australia, Spain, Turkey, Taiwan, and Italy, could also possibly deploy something like the F-35 from existing um, or projected amphibious assault or helicopter carrier ships and deliver capability, although, of course, not to the same level as you would expect an aircraft carrier due to size and the support infrastructure on board those vessels. Uh, but for now, let me hand over to Mike in Washington, D.C. to look at the U.S. carrier fleet. Thank you, and good day, everyone. Uh, what I'd like to do today is provide a general snapshot of the status of the U.S. carrier programs and why they continue to be a U.S. projection force of choice. Um, next slide. Okay, where are the carriers? It's a cliche to say that this is the first kind of question that most U.S. presidents have asked going back now for almost seven decades when there's a time of crisis around the world. Uh, but the fact of the matter is a cliche is a cliche for a reason. And this is exactly the question the U.S. presidents do ask because, well, nothing pro provides the projection of force or sends a signal the same way the carriers do. Just look what's happening right now in the Korean Peninsula. Because with our U.S. president, going over there for his first Asian trip, and with North Korea um, having this missile test and threatening the region and the world with missile test and something more than that, the U.S. right now has three carrier strike groups all converged around the peninsula all about the same time. Now, the Pentagon has said this is a, a coincidence, but there's a lot of logistical gymnastics involved in putting carriers like this all at the same place, same time. Last time this happened was off the coast of Guam about a decade ago when the U.S. had the same kind of situation that could get three carrier strike groups and everything like that. But nothing this far west into Asian waters has happened. There's also another old saying that a carrier represents about 90,000 tons of diplomacy. In this case, we have 108,000 tons of diplomacy coming right on to the region. Next slide, please. The U.S. really is the only one that can provide this kind of projection force with these three carrier strike groups. And one of the reasons is because the U.S. is the only one that has a forward deployed carrier strike group. The U.S. actually has a carrier and a strike group deployed to a part of the world and based there. And right now it's the Ronald Reagan out of Japan. But at the same time, what we have here is we have the Nimitz that is transiting back from, from the Mideast and or points around there, and the Theodore Roosevelt going out to take his place. And so because of this, you this transit transiting of carriers in the forward base of a carrier. You can now, summing up all we've heard so far, it's uh, absolutely clear that uh, carriers are very expensive assets and have come under criticism in terms of utility and cost. However, also the message is clear that uh, those nations which have it continue to operate it and operate them and build them, and other countries are joining that club or expanding their fleets. Uh, there are a number of other naval assets like amphibious uh, assault ships and helicopter carriers, which combined particularly with the next generation uh, F-35 uh, B stubble aircraft may add further capability beyond those carriers to a number of countries. Um, and China is certainly looking to expand its fleet considerably in the next years as well, which will be interesting to watch. 
the UK is rebuilding its capabilities and a number of other countries are expanding and planning towards uh, rebuilding and maintaining their capability in the future as well. And with, with we that, look forward to welcoming you to future online briefings. Our next online briefing, which is on terrorism and insurgency trends, will be held on Thursday, uh, the 16th of November. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, goodbye. Thank you.